committee will now come to order. We will start our unanticipated third panel. appreciate the two of you being here to answer questions before this committee. It is my understanding, having worked with both sides and my understanding from the two of you who I have yet to speak with, that should this panel run short, that is, members not be allowed to fully ask all the questions that, that we have here today, that you both will personally agree to come back and participate in another hearing as a follow-up. We will call this part one of part one <laughs> of, this, uh, of this hearing. And I would hope and expect that the two of you would also be able to attend uh, that second hearing. We will come to it by mutual agreement in terms of the date. It will be your own panel, so you are not offended by anybody. Is that your understanding of how we are going to proceed? Mr. Cain. Mr. Chairman, yes, it is. Mr. Kerr. Yes, Mr. Chairman. As long as we have the, uh, the ranking member here and, and uh, we have an understanding of how that is going to proceed, we will proceed. Mr. Lee uh, Kerr is the Assistant Administrator for Security Operations at the TSA. And Mr. Robin Kane is the Assistant Administrator for Security Technology uh, at the TSA. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you please rise and raise your right hands. Do you, solemnly, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, what we would ask is allow you to each uh, take five minutes for your opening statements. Uh, please adhere to the red light that will appear before you. We will give you some, uh, some leeway with that. Keep your comments to five minutes, and then we will allow you to submit any additional testimony that you are not able to give verbally uh, into the record for the full committee. So at, at this time, we will recognize first Mr. Kane uh, for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Chaffetz. Ranking Member Tierney, Ranking Member Cummings, <clears throat> and distinguished members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Transportation Security Administration's risk-based, intelligence-driven approach to aviation security, and specifically the use of advanced imaging technology. As a Chief Technology Officer, I will focus on the technical aspects, and our Director of Security Operations, Lee Kerr, will discuss the human aspect. Before going into more detail, let me state it clearly. The technology is vital to our Nation's ability to keep air travelers safe in this post-9-11 world. Mr. Chairman, the United States faces a determined, creative enemy bent on the destruction of our way of life. The threat is everywhere. Last year, the FBI arrested a man planning an attack on the D.C. subway system. A few weeks ago, a young Saudi man was arrested under suspicion of plotting terror attacks in Texas as a lone wolf jihadist. And whether it was a failed attack on Christmas Day 2009, this disrupted cargo plot last October, or the latest intelligence we see every day, we know Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups continue to target our aviation system. Our security measures must focus on detecting and disrupting today's threat, not yesterday's. Today we have a nimble aviation security system that deploys multiple layers of risk-based, intelligence-driven security measures. The checkpoint is a central piece of the puzzle. And one aspect of the checkpoint is what we are here to discuss today. Mr. Chairman, well-concealed, nonmetallic, improvised explosive devices are now among the gravest threat to security. And while there is no silver bullet, AIT, the advanced imaging technology, gives us the best opportunity to detect these threats. We first piloted the advanced imaging technology in early 2007, knowing of these threats. <clears throat> Following testing and analysis, we began deploying the technology nationwide after the <clears throat> Excuse me, nationwide. After the failed Christmas Day 2009 attack, we accelerated it. In our ongoing testing and development, we know that well concealed devices like those used on Christmas Day 2009 can be detected by AIT. It is then up to the image operator to recognize the anomaly. Beyond effectiveness, there are two other issues I will address privacy and safety. AIT units in airports cannot store, print, or transmit images. The system will require different, different software to make this a possibility. Anonymity is also paramount. The officer reviewing the image does not see the passenger, and the officer assisting the passenger cannot see the image. AIT also does not produ produce photographic quality images that would permit personal identification. We are now testing auto detection software to further enhance privacy by eliminating passenger specific images and instead highlighting anomalies on a generic outline. Testing is ongoing to ensure that this software provides the same detection capability as previous versions of the advanced imaging technology. Passengers appreciate it, and we hope to roll it out nationwide in the near future. On safety, 
This technology is safe for all passengers and employees. The radiation dose from backscatter advanced imaging technology machines has been independently confirmed by the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Johns Hopkins University, and the U.S. Army, among others. <clears throat> All this testing confirmed that the radiation dose is well within established standards. As constructed, backscatter AIT is incapable of producing the energy required to generate radiation at a level that would exceed the established standards. Failsafe mechanisms are installed to automatically shut the machines down should they begin operating in unexpected ways. Multiple tests occur on each individual unit before it is ever used to screen passengers. Ongoing testing occurs on every unit, consistent with national standards to confirm continued safe operation. Additional testing is conducting if a machine is relocated or requires other maintenance. Contractors are required to notify both TSA and FDA if they find radiation levels above the standard. We recently committed to publishing all future radiation tests online so the public will be able to see for themselves that their home airports have safe technology. While reviewing old reports, we identified errors in some of the contractors' record keeping. These errors are unacceptable, and we are taking steps to ensure they are not repeated, including we are retesting those where they had an error, we are retraining the workforce that, is doing, that are doing those surveys, we are expanding our independent evaluation of the safety protocols, and we are having increased uh, expertise in our own staffs and TSA to be able to have subject matter ex experts review the surveys as they come in. We believe these significant steps will enhance our ability to, to assure the public that all technology is safe. With that, I will turn it over to Lee. Thank you, Mr. Kane. We will now recognize Mr. Uh, Mr. Kerr for uh, five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today regarding the Transportation Security Administration's use of imaging technology at airport security checkpoints. As my colleague stated, current intelligence reminds us that commercial aviation remains a top terrorist target. On Christmas Day 2009, Umar Farooq Omnibutalib attempted to blow up a plane bound for the U.S. using a nonmetallic explosive device that was not, was not, and could not have been discovered by a metal detector. Our success in staying ahead of dedicated adversaries is dependent upon our ability to utilize the latest technologies and procedures. As the head of TSA's security operations, overseeing the work of TSA's frontline security employees, I can assure you that our nearly 50,000 officers and managers at over 450 airports nationwide are dedicated to our important security mission. Every day, TSA screens nearly 2 million passengers to ensure they arrive safely at their destinations. We use a variety of security techniques to ensure our transportation systems remain secure, including advanced imaging technology, or AIT. I want to reemphasize that while there is no silver bullet when it comes to aviation security, advanced imaging technology, in combination with our checkpoint procedures and the work of our dedicated workforce, provides us with the best tools to detect dangerous threats. Advanced imaging technology remains optional to all passengers who may request alternate screening to include a pat-down. As we have deployed advanced imaging technology, TSA has continued to evolve its pat-down procedures as well as to mitigate threats. There are a few things I want to clarify regarding TSA's pat-down procedures. First, only a small percentage of passengers require a pat-down during the secondary screening process. Pat-downs are conducted by same-gender officers, and all passengers have the right to request private screening at any time during the screening process. In addition, any passenger may choose to be accompanied by an individual of their choosing, such as a parent, guardian, or traveling companion throughout the screening process. While it is necessary to ensure that all passengers are properly screened, TSA is sensitive to passenger needs. For example, our officers are trained to work with parents and passengers with special needs to ensure a respectful screening process for the entire family. Additionally, TSA's Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties maintains a coalition of more than 70 disability-related groups who partner with TSA to inform our checkpoint screening procedures, including the use of advanced imaging technology. We continue to work closely with these groups to ensure we are constantly improving the training we provide to our officers, which ultimately enhances the passenger experience. While we continue to work with stakeholders and partners, we are dedicated to also continuing to engage and inform the traveling public regarding the use of technologies such as AIT as well as our procedures. We want to ensure the traveling public understands the screening process while protecting the information terrorists could use in an attempt to circumvent screening protocols. 
As part of that effort, we have worked with our airport partners to post signage at airports regarding AIT on our website, through the media, and via hundreds of press conferences, as well as social networking platforms. Through these mechanisms, TSA has reached millions of individuals nationwide to inform them about airport security policies and procedures. Additionally, TSA is committed to answering questions and receiving feedback from the public regarding their screening experience. To achieve this, TSA utilizes a number of communication tools, including the TSA Contact Center, the Talk to, TSA, to TSA web feedback tool, local customer service managers, and input on the TSA blog, among other avenues. TSA is committed to building upon best practices to mitigate risk and make our transportation systems as safe as possible. Earlier this month, Administrator Pistol outlined his vision for the future of airport security screening as we develop additional risk-based initiatives that shift away from a one-size-fits-all approach at airport checkpoints. TSA anticipates that this type of innovative approach will enable TSA to better focus its resources while enhancing the passenger experience. We want to thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing on TSA's use of advanced imaging technology and for its diligent work in overseeing the agency's efforts to ensure the transportation security. We are pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes. We, uh, we have a great need in this country to secure aircraft and transportation in general. The, the threat is real. Let, let there be no mistake from anybody on anywhere, the threat is very real. I appreciate the good, hard and work that the tens of thousands of TSA agents do. I think most are trying to do a good job. They are working hard. They are placed in a difficult situation. In fact, I think a lot of them who probably signed up to do this didn't envision that they were suddenly going to have to be uh, involved in some very invasive pat-downs and doing some things that when they probably first signed up they weren't anticipating to do. And I appreciate both of you in your degree of participation uh, with public service. Uh, Mr. Kane, for instance, your 20 years in the Coast Guard and whatnot. We appreciate that. Nevertheless, I, I do and am very frustrated by the lack of candor coming from the Transportation Security Administration. I just, the TSA has earned a notorious reputation of doing things a bit different than the way they say they are doing it. That is not a personal attack on you two as individuals. And I, know we, I, I want to note at the beginning, it is not a direct criticism on any, any one of you personally. But given that you are sitting here, and I am glad you are sitting here, and we are going to have this discussion, uh, I just want to note that it is our role and responsibility to make sure that we improve security and still protect people with their Fourth Amendment rights, that we minimize the invasive nature in which this technology is, is being deployed, not just the technology, but the pat-downs as well. Uh, with, with that said, I, I want to start to dive in here a little deeper on these machines. Um, and start, I guess, for, for instance, uh, with you, Mr. Kane. I mean, these machines, as I understand it, were, were built to the specifications, correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yet I have heard repeatedly that, quote, the imaging technology that we use cannot store, export, print, or transmit images, end quote. That came from Secretary Napolitano. Is that true? The machines in the airports cannot store or transmit um, images. Uh, the, the software packages is on those machines does not allow that in the airport. We do have machines in our testing environment where we do have that capability. And same machines, though, right? Same machines, hardware-wise. Same machines. Okay. Yeah. Hardware-wise. You just, Mr. Uh, Chairman, yeah. <laughs> My understanding, I am looking at this uh, Freedom of Information Act that was put out there and the, the, the uh, uh, specifications were put out. Let me read a few things. Enabling and disabling of imaging filter shall be modified by users as defined by the user access levels and capabilities index. Let me go on. When in test mode, the, the whole body imaging machine, the WBI, shall allow exporting of image data in real time, shall provide secure means of, of high speed transfer of image data, shall allow exporting of image data raw and reconstructed. Did I misread anything here? Is that accurate? I believe you are referring to probably a, a prior specification, some of which we have cleaned up in, in subsequent uh, engineering change proposals. 
to, to make sure that those test modes are separate. So you, you, re you referenced, Mr. Chairman, a test mode. Um, that mode does not exist in the airport environment. It, the machines in those airports have a different software package that, that does not exist. You said the same, the same machines have those capabilities. My understanding is that the network, that each of them are uh, built with a, quote, unquote, network interface with an Ethernet interface connection. The network interface shall be configured with an IP address which would suggest that it is actually transferring images, is it not? Uh, none of the machines today are networked um, in the airports. That capability is in the um, hardware of those machines. They are not networked in the airport. So they do have the capabilities of doing it. And you, you actually do capture and transmit images, right? Even Just think about this. From the very standpoint of the fact that somebody goes through the machine, you capture the image, it is then transferred electronically to somebody in another room, correct? That image then appears on their screen. That is correct. How is that not capturing, transmitting, or storing the image? I think our point is we don't save those images, we don't retain them, we don't transmit them. That, I would argue that is the same part of the machine and that the, that image review station is, is part and parcel of that um, advanced imaging technology machine. And, we, of course, we have a display monitor on that machine to be able to look at the images uh, for the image operators to be able to resolve anomalies or identify anomalies to be resolved. Under oath, I want to ask you both. Do you transmit images that you have captured in airports ever? Have you done that? Captured in airports, I'm, I am completely unaware of us ever having done that. So I would say no, under oath, we do not transmit images from the airport. Have you ever done that? I am unaware of us having ever done that. Mr. Kerr. I am unaware of us ever doing that, sir. You have in your specifications that you have to have these capabilities. Why was that in there in the first place? Clearly, um, when we develop this type of technology, like any other piece of technology we have, we have to do extensive testing, we have to do extensive training um, to be able to deploy those machines. Therefore, we have a capability on those machines to operate in the test mode. Um, to capture images, to be able to uh, transmit those images to other machines so that in our networks that we use in testing facilities, uh, we, we have that capability. We don't have that capability in the airports. We, we separated that capability completely out from anything that is in the airport. Um, and, and the other piece, we do have images that we use that were taken from volunteers, and typically those are paid volunteers that we use in our testing processes to capture those images. What about this so-called Level Z access? capabilities under, quote, unquote, level Z access, enable and, enable and disable image filters, export raw image data in test mode, modify access level capabilities, download data. How many people have, first of all, Mr. Kerr, how many people have a user access level Z capability? So that is actually a question for, for Mr. Kane. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Kane. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am not sure of the exact number, but I would like to just say the, the specification, specification to, to make sure we gave greater confidence to people that we were not doing the things that um, people are talking about, we removed some of those capabilities from the Z user access. Typically, those are maintenance technicians, um, and people, some of my folks in my labs have that type of cap, uh, can you, Z user can access. You provide the, can you provide this committee the email or the, the, the paperwork that would verify that you have actually changed that and when it was changed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, certainly we will do that for the record. So when I see under the TSA website, quote, the image cannot be stored, transmitted, or printed and deleted immediately once viewed, I mean, that is fundamentally false, is it not? It does have that capability. It is a matter of flipping the switch, turning it off and on. It is not a matter of flipping a switch and turning it off and on. The software that is on the airport machines does not allow that capability in the airport. The software in our testing machines is a completely separate software and has that capability in our labs. Has it ever had that capability? When you first deployed it, did it have that capability? Uh, in those initial, the first, uh, I believe, 47 that we rolled out, uh, that capability was on the machines to flip that switch at that Z user level access that you are referring to. Um, we recognized that we wanted to change that, and we made a change on the machines that are in the airports and, and retrofitted it to all those machines that are in the airports. I would, I would, the committee would appreciate it if you would provide that paperwork. My apologies to the ranking member. I did not realize how far over time I was. Uh, I, I will um, now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes and some more, if he would like it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think it is important that you get the questions that you have answered, so I have no objection to using the time on that. Um, but let me. I don't mean to just pound this thing to death, but I want to make sure that we are clear on it, because it seems to be a trust issue here, clearly. 
on that. I am reading your, uh, the requirements on sensitive security information, and it says, I will quote, a TSA policy dictates that passenger privacy is maintained and protected during passenger screening. To ensure passenger privacy safeguards are in place, AIT systems will prohibit the storage and exporting of passenger images during normal screening operations. While not being used for normal screening operations, the capability to capture images of non-passengers for training and evaluation purposes is needed. To ensure that image capturing re maintains passenger privacy, the AIT systems will provide two distinct modes of operation, screening mode and test mode. During screening mode, the AIT system shall be prohibited from exporting passenger image data, including via STIP. During test mode, the AIT system shall not be capable of conducting passenger screening. Does that sound accurate to you? Yes, Congressman. Okay. So what we need to do is somehow give assurances to people that are doubtful on that. And how do you suggest we do that? Uh, it is very uh, difficult at times to do that. Um, we have talked about it. We, we have offered up the specifications. We have made some of those changes that you referred to. We have actually changed in the specification to make it more clear of how we intend to operate the machines. Um, we put out a privacy impact assessment that talks about how we intend to operate the machines, and we try and be very straightforward with the public, with the signage um, and, and the other uh, messaging mechanisms we have to make it clear to the public how we intend to operate the machines and the fact that we don't store, transmit, retain any of the images, and they are deleted when they leave the machines once we have resolved any anomalies. It is the ability to do all those things you just said basically contained in the software as opposed to the hardware? At this point, yes, Congressman. Do you have plans to do it otherwise? No. I, we, at one point they were kind of together where you could flip a switch as a Z user level. We have separated that capability, um, and the airport machines don't have that capability. So if, if Mr. Uh, Chaffetz wanted to go to the airport, he would see that the software at any given airport uh, is disabling all of the problems that he has or the concerns that he has. Uh, does we, not allow them. It is probably hard, difficult to see that at the airport from a um, non expert, but we could certainly endeavor to Bring show Bring an expert that. with them, <laughs> okay, on that. All right. Now, can you tell me whether or not uh, the millimeter wave scanners uh, are as effective or more effective than the X ray backscatter scanners? I, I can't talk about the specific requirements and, and uh, capabilities in, in an open hearing. I am happy to share sure that. Sure, you can. I mean, come on, you can't tell me whether or not they are as effective as the others? So what I would say is both have met our specifications. Um, so we had specifications that we put out, and, and both met those specifications in, in very near similar levels, and, and they um, flipped a bit depending on where you were using them. And you're, I mean, I, I don't accept your answer that you can't tell us open session, but I am going to for the moment uh, on that, because my basic point here is that you are saying they are interchangeable and the TSA would be satisfied with whatever machine happened to be in a given airport that it was doing the job you wanted done? That is the first statement, Congressman. Okay. Uh, now, the only reason you don't go just to the wave scanners where there is no issue at all with respect to uh, radiation is that it is at TSA's contention that the levels are so low in the X-ray back scanner that it, that it is not a problem. That is one of the reasons. Um, it is very safe technology and it is very, very low. Um, radiation as, as we have tested independently many times. But the other is um, it is useful for us to have multiple technologies. As we talked about, we do need to address the threat. Having a number of people working on the th problems of addressing the threat is useful to us. Having competition in our marketplace where we buy, we are the primary buyer in the world of, of technologies is useful to us as well. Well, I understand. I am all about competition uh, on that, as the, uh, the F-136 debate will, will indicate. But the fact of the matter is here, um, if you thought it was a risk, a danger, you would just take the chance of going with a monopoly as opposed to having one area out there that was a competitor but dangerous. Uh, we think the technology is very safe, yes, okay, on that. So will you uh, make available to the public your evaluation studies uh, and make the, uh, the equipment available for independent testing? Uh, we have never really made the equipment available for independent testing. That, it, that would um, expose it to a lot of public uh, information that we wouldn't share publicly in terms of its capabilities. We you don't think there's a way to do that and not expose it? I mean, uh, it's done uh, all the time. Radiation-wise, we certainly have done that with independent validators. We've had John Hopkins. We had National Institute exactly. of Standards and Technology. Just making it available to to the public to look at those machines. No, um, we wouldn't be able to do that. All right. But other than making it generally available to the public, you would make it available to other independent uh, sources that were qualified to make an evaluation. You have done it and you would do it again if it was set up appropriately? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Can you, do you know whether or not the materials that were used by the shoe bomber and the underwear bomber, whatever you, you want to call them, could have been detected or would have been detected by the AIT machines? Those types of materials, what, what advanced imaging technology does is detect anomalies on the body. Those types of materials are anomalous to the body, and, and so, yes, it does detect those types of materials. Um, we, we have found, you know, we, we tested against similar types of materials in the labs, and, and certainly in their operation on the day-to-day -day use, Lee could speak to a number of the things that you find that are similar to those types of materials as well. And, and one of our previous witnesses testified that the uh, Department of Homeland Security and TSA had basically funded uh, a National Academy of Sciences report where it made a recommendation at the end for evaluating the effectiveness of all initiatives um, and, and in a systemic way, a systematic way, rather, and then had a, a whole process out there. Do you follow that process when you are evaluating the different techniques? I think if you are talking about the process we use for, for developing our technologies, yes, we use a sy systematic process in doing that. Do you use the one that was recommended by the National Academy of Sciences for which you paid? Uh, we use our process as mandated by the Department of Homeland Security in their acquisition guidelines. We use that process. Do you know how that measures up to the, the Congressman, recommendations I don't know. I apologize. I don't, I don't Could know you that. get that for the record Certainly for us and give us that. an indication of how your policy, your standards? and your evaluation process line up with the recommendations made by the National Academy of Sciences in the 2008 report that was paid for by uh, in the Homeland Security and the TSA? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Y'all, in, in response to some privacy concerns, you have implemented the pat-down search as well as the secondary pat-down search for the anomalies. And the Ninth Court of Appeals has allowed you all to do administrative searches at airports and held that the pat-downs are legal. I think their words were limited in its, in its intrusiveness as it is consistent with uh, satisfactory of the administrative need that justifies it. So limited in the intrusiveness, I think, is kind of key there. Uh, but take a look at some of these slides we have got up here. I'm concerned that these, these are not even the secondary pat-downs. These are the primary Pat downs. Now, this is a child, another child. There are people who would go to jail for ch touching a child like that. Do you really think these are the least intrusive means you can come up with to ensure security? Sir, the, uh, Mr. Kane and I actually sit every morning in an intelligence brief where we learn the, um, what is coming at us from our attackers. And what is evident to us is that the, uh, those that wish to do us harm are very willing to um, use techniques which uh, uh, go against our social norms and, um, and try to use things that will can uh, use our process against us. And that's, uh, that was proven out actually in uh, uh, Flight 253 with the placement of a, a bomb that used all nonmetallic components. And so we have done extensive testing in what uh, techniques we can use in order to um, uh, be able to detect items like that using both process and technology um, so that we can uh, mitigate that threat while also being as conscious as possible about uh, the passengers' experiences are coming through, as well as allowing passengers to uh, expeditiously get to the And then you also indicated in your testimony that only a small percentage of passengers have uh, undergone a secondary screening. I have had the misfortune of being one of those passengers, and I was taken into a private room, not offered the opportunity to stay in public or have anyone accompany me, and was thoroughly searched. I was not offered the opportunity to, to rescan in the event I had moved. The uh, TSA agent indicated you probably moved. That is why there were the anomalies. A rescan would have avoided that. Wouldn't that have been a less intrusive option is to offer me a rescan when they had, I think there were five anomalies detected on my body? Sir, without getting too much into the uh, sensitive security part of when we do which type of uh, screening, uh, when we do have uh, an anomaly in a sensitive area, uh, we do want to make sure that we properly um, uh, screen that area using a pat-down. Uh, any passenger is uh, authorized to have a, 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 a companion in that private screening room with them. 
Um, and uh, we, we use whatever technique we can. I mean, I would have rather have had this happen in the sunshine is the best disinfectant. I'd, despite as embarrassing as it was, I preferred to have stand out there and let the rest of the people at the airport see what I was subjected to. Let me move on. I am concerned also about the safety of your hardworking TS, uh, TSA officers. Uh, why do none of the officers that work around these uh, X-ray machines in particular not wear, this, wear the same safety badges that anybody who works at a hospital is required to wear? This seems like a low-cost way to ensure the safety of the people working for you. Uh, Congressman, these are uh, different, and, and they are very, very low levels of radiation used by these machines, um, and, and they are well within public use limits. And there, there are national standards for when you would implement a dosimeter type of program that you are referring to, and, and we are well, well below any of those levels uh, that would cause us to look at uh, putting the radiation badges on the workers. And, and I can understand why you are also not willing to open up the entire software and process to peer review, but would you be willing to allow independent agencies to, uh, or in, independent, the scientific community to test the amount of radiation that these machines uh, Emit, sir, and we we have done a number of independent tests, and we have ongoing independent tests for all of these machines in the airports. Uh, John Hopkins did the study on the backscatter uh, advanced imaging technology as an independent body. Uh, the Army's Public Health Command comes into airports. They have they have looked at uh, they look at our radiating machines in airports. Um, and they use uh, test and survey methods, including dosimeters in some cases, and they have done extensive independent testing of the machines and, and clearly and consistently show very, very low levels of radiation. I see my time has expired. I will wait around for the next round of questions. I have a whole other page. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman, gentleman yields back. We now recognize the gentleman from, Il from Maryland or Illinois. But the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here. Um, how many of these machines are in place now? There are nearly, four, nearly 500 in airports and 78 different airports. Okay. And how many do you need if you are going to use them at every location and every gate? Uh, we are working through what that would be. Some of it depends on what the final capability of the machines is, especially with this automated target recognition software that we put on. You can get more people through those types of machines than you can with the image operator. Um, we think that number is going to somewhere, something less than 1,800. Um, is, and the 1,800 has been the number that we have used, but it will probably be something less than that. We have 2,200. To give you some concept of scope, we have 20, around 2,200 lanes, airport lanes in the country. And um, is there a concern that you have? I mean, if those were all in place with, with the new technology and the times to get through, it would not change the times that it takes to get X number of people through O'Hare Airport in a day, if every one of those entrances? Uh, Congressman, we are very sensitive to that. That is why I say that the final number will depend on what the technology becomes capable of and how fast it can process a passenger. Right now, you see it in the airport. You will see it sitting next to a walk-through metal detector to, to alleviate just that concern. We are going to keep that configuration until we know we don't have that concern and we won't cause that to be the impact at the checkpoints. Is there a, a projected time frame now? to have all these in place, a range? I can tell you that we had uh, we have nearly 500 in the airports today. We had 500 in our in the President's fiscal year 11 uh, budget request. Um, how the CR plays out or how the, the fiscal year 11 budget plays out, we will we'll see. But we think there is 500 um, within that level. And then the fiscal year 12 request is for 275 additional machines. So that would bring the total to 1275 at that point. You mentioned the new capabilities and the new technology that would be less, uh, it would be more generic, I guess, in terms of what body images are shown? Yes. You, you would see at the machine itself a very generic outline. It is the same outline for everyone. Um, and, and you just see that. And any anomalies would show up on that outline. And that allows for, um, one, to, to just do the resolution right at the machine, and two, a very limited um, pat-down or targeted pat-down. So if I keep my BlackBerry in my pocket, you know, it's going to show on my pocket, and, and the, the officer will just have to resolve that alarm right there on my pocket. But, um, and, and the reason I'm asking is, it would, if it seems like it's a reasonable period of time before that technology will be available, you would want to start shifting over to those right away before you purchase 2,200 of them. Uh, we, we think there is a reasonable amount of time that that technology will be available, and, and we stated a number of times that we expect our next procurement to have that capability. 
Very good. Thank you. I yield back. Will the gentleman yield? Can I? Yes. Earlier, I just want to make sure, Mr. Cain, I, I heard exactly what you said. I, I won't, have any of these machines transmitted, have you emailed, have you sent anything back to the headquarters? And I believe your answer to that was that you were unaware of any, right? Correct. Why isn't the answer to that no? It doesn't even have the capability. See, that gives me a pause to think, you had to think about that. You came to the conclusion, and I gave you a few more minutes to think about it. Well, not that I am aware of, isn't quite as definitive as no, it is not even capable of doing it. It is like if I said, can your airplane, did you fly to New York and your airplane said, no, it can't even fly. What are you, are you crazy? So I can tell you no authoritatively since we have started rolling them out in airports. I was not involved with the program from its inception, and I don't know some of what it occurred earlier in the program's inception, I am virtually certain. But I can't say for certainty just because I wasn't the one who would have been witness to what was in the airports and how they were um, used in the airports. But TSA has always been on the record of saying, no, we don't do this, we have never had this capability. And, and so I couldn't say authoritatively, though, from before my time there. I appreciate that. But just because you are, quote, unquote, on the record, that is the concern, is that I find the inconsistency between sometimes what the record is, and I have some personal experience of this, I won't, I won't take the time of this committee, but that is the concern. Instead of hearing a definitive no, it is not even capable, what I read are specifications to say, well, we got an Ethernet cable, we got the IP address, we have got you know, ability to, it, it basically has all the capabilities that you say it doesn't have. And that is the fundamental challenge. I have taken this gentleman's time, I will yield back my time, and now recognizably the gentleman from Maryland uh, for five minutes. Yes, the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Please. Chairman, I just noticed <coughs> you all stopped the clock for about two or three minutes. So, uh, did you know that? <laughs> let me let me just say, gentlemen, you all have a very tough job. You have a very very tough job. You weren't here a little bit earlier when I said that. Um, you know, you you gotta protect the public. And at the same time, you have got to try to make sure you have a, a fair balance so that you are not intruding into people's lives unreasonably and their bodies. And that is a, that's a tough one. And as I listen to, the, um, to all of what has been said so far, there has been an overhanging this hearing. And I think with the Chairman's statement just now, there is a very, very significant shadow hanging over TSA, and that is clearly that, and, it's, and it goes to a five-letter word, trust. And you all, I mean, you know, when I listen to all of the discussion, you all, there is a lot of information you cannot divulge. And I'm no intelligence expert, but I would imagine that part of the problem is, is that you don't want to let people know what certain things are happening with these machines so that they can get around them, I guess. Is, is that right? I mean, does that make sense? Yes, sir. On the other hand, you have a Congress who, which wants to know and the public wants to know, and that's a, that's a, kind of, that's a tough situation. Um, and I guess what, I'm, what I want to get to is, you know, I, I want to have that trust. I want to believe that just like members of Congress raise their hand and swear to protect the people we represent, that you all go in there every day trying to figure out how you can best protect every single person that uses uh, that use our airways. And so how would you all suggest, given all that I just said and what you know, that we establish and um, get that trust back, you know? Because apparently, and, and you know, when I'm, the more I think about it, it's so easy to lose the trust when you can't give up so much information, when you've got, when you've got millions of opportunities for something to go wrong. Um, but how do we get back there? Because that's what it's all about. I mean, first of all, you got to have the trust, 
but at the, and then there's another piece of this is you've got to do things um, in a way that's least intrusive, but you got to have there has to be a level of trust for people to believe that you're doing it in the least intrusive way. So help me with that. Mr. Congressman, what I can say is that when you look back at uh, previous attacks, uh, even since 9-11, our adversary does look for uh, processes um, or prohibited items which are, are items which are not prohibited at the time, such as 9-11, they used an item uh, that was not prohibited at the time, or they, uh, I think they look at what our process is and try to use that process against us, such as the Richard Reed shoe bomb, they, uh, they recognized at the time that, um, that using a nonmetallic improvised explosive device going through a metal detector was a viable way of going through. So from a TSA perspective, we have to look every day at uh, what are we seeing from a threat perspective and trying to uh, put processes or technology in place to be able to thwart that type of a risk or threat. Um, and at the same time be able to communicate with the traveling public so they know what to expect when they come through the checkpoint. Um, so it, it is a balancing act that we have to uh, balance um, every day, and it boils down to having a very active dialogue with the American public. Uh, we use a variety of ways of trying to do that, including, um, you know, pretty robust um, uh, dialogue on the Internet. We have, a, you know, an award-winning blog, for example, where we encourage the American people to have that discussion with them. Uh, about why it is that we are doing what, we, what, what it is we do every day, and we want to make sure that the traveling public um, is able to navigate our screening process. I am running, running out of time, but I wanted to ask you this. When I heard the representative earlier, she uh, testified, one of the things that she talked about was training and that there seemed to be, you know, when, you know, I think part of trust, too, is that people feel that they are treated with respect, that they, that they may be going through some difficulty, that, but somebody hears them, somebody understands them, somebody has empathy. I think that goes a long ways towards trust also. And uh, just comment, then I'm, my time's up. Yes, sir, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, we emphasize to our officers, I think our officers are probably some of the most trained and tested um, of any profession uh, out there. And one of the things that we do emphasize with our officers um, is proper communication uh, to de-escalate the traveling process, just traveling, much less screening is a stressful pro proposition for particularly like a family going through. And so our officers are trained um, and uh, for the most part do a very good job of de-escalating stress as they are going through that process. We actually retrained our entire workforce about two and a half years ago uh, to emphasize um, customer service as well as, as uh, security because the two actually go hand in hand. We also have another training initiative this year to, uh, to get at that same exact issue of good communication which de-escalates stress to assist them in getting through. It's a, it's a partnership with the American public where we want them to, be, to help us in the screening process as they are going through our checkpoints. The gentleman uh, yields back. We now recognize the chairman of the overall committee, uh, Mr. Issa from California, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your, uh, your patience in, uh, in getting through a long day. This is an important panel. We have waited for, for you two because this committee has serious doubts <clears throat> about the effectiveness and efficiency and authority <clears throat> for some of the things you are doing. I think that is pretty clear. The chairman is particularly interested in the full body scanners. I am interested in the overall process. So as someone who was here on 9-11, who remembers President George W. Bush telling us it wouldn't change America, I am concerned that it has. You represent 57,000 well-meaning people. I debate well-trained because your turnover is still pretty darn high, and it is awful hard to have that many newbies and always say they are well-trained. Almost every time I go through security, I see training, which is a good thing. But the bad thing is I see the need for training every time I go through. Mr. Kerr, let me go through something that isn't full body scanners. I will give you a little relief. I fly more than 40 round trips a year, plus many overseas trips. For more than six years, I carried in my carry-on baggage on every single flight a pair of folding scissors. That pair of folding scissors was taken away two weeks ago. That pair of folding scissors, if you, if you open them up and elongate them, has one inch of blade times two, 
and its overall length is 2 inches. I have researched and cannot find a basis for taking that away. Do you have an explanation for that kind of subjectivity? Were they wrong 200, let me rephrase that, 40 times 2 is 80, uh, you know, 320 times they were wrong? Or were they right one time and I can't find proof that that is a, a prohibited item? So we actually did an analysis on uh, the prohibited items list, uh, I want to say November of 2005, that time frame, where we did a risk-based analysis of what was prohibited. I remember my toothpaste being taken away after we discovered that liquids could be a problem in the British situation. Uh, you didn't have an answer. You just took them all away. Then you made the answer three ounces. But specifically, the scissors, as I described, are they prohibited? Uh, during that analysis in November of 2005, that time frame, uh, we actually changed the prohibited items list, and uh, scissors uh, with a length of less than 4 inches from the fulcrum are not prohibited. So I don't have an explanation for why they would have been um, uh, removed two weeks ago. Eight weeks earlier, I had a 12-millimeter open-end box wrench taken away. It was 5 inches long. Can you explain that one? Um, so small tools was another uh, piece of the um, uh, analysis that was done. And there is some discretion on uh, t tools where um, if it could be used as a bludgeon uh, in the uh, discretion of the TSO, then it would be prohibited. Um, if it uh, is just a normal tool, I believe less than 7 inches, uh, it would be uh, allowable. All of that information is actually up on TSA.gov. We have a, a Oh, I went there. But when you say you have got to be kidding, you get threatened. You get people who make it, make it very clear they are law enforcement. So I am concerned about something. I am concerned that some people think a, a less than 5-inch, 12-millimeter uh, open-end box wrench is a bludgeoning tool. I am concerned that a 1-inch worth of point and cutting uh, plus another 2 inches of, of, of little uh, the rest of a scissors are somehow dangerous, but they only do it very infrequently. And please, as a guy with a motorcycle, don't, don't ask me to explain how I had a 12-millimeter open box that I had gotten on the wrong coast, but these things happen. The fact is you don't have a consistent system to test. Today you are saying we are safer. Well, in fact, only a fraction of the people are going through these full-body scanners, and the full-body scanners are repeatedly false positing and hu positively in huge numbers. Isn't that true? I understand all the good at work and the improvement they are trying, but isn't it true that my statement is fair, that only a fraction of the people go through them and they have huge false positives today? Uh, today only a fraction of the people go through them. Uh, they have false positives. Um, not a huge number of false positives. How about in San Diego, it is about every fifth person that goes through gets a secondary? Uh, that would be possible. Okay. So 20 percent is not huge, but it is close enough to huge for if you are one of the people getting a pat down. You have heard testimony here today that, in fact, low-level X-ray is longstanding to be a problem. What assurance do we have here today that you are not going to be the next fluoroscope? You are not going to be the next situation in which you say, well, it is not a problem. But members on the dais who go back and forth across this country uh, literally 40, 50 round trips a year aren't getting overexposed if, if, in fact, you eventually get to implementing full time this procedure. The machines have been tested repeatedly to show how safe they are and independently to show how safe they are. And they are tested against national standards that are set by standards making body who have a host of experts on them. And they are um, they set those standards that we work towards. We are well below those standards for this technology, for backscatter in particular, I believe you are referring to, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am referring to people get involuntarily getting x-rays or being forced into a secondary because now they have said, no, I don't want to. The elimination of trusted, trusted traveler, granted it went bankrupt. All of that contributes to the whole question that year after year after year, each time you find out what you didn't know, which right now includes you can't detect a bomb sewn into a human being. As a result, you are not going to pick up the bomber willing to have surgery to implant explosives under their skin. That has been said here today. It has been well documented. You are also not well, never mind, I am going to just close with one thing. Would you please report back to the committee the following? Earlier today, it was in the opening, in Mr. Kerr's opening statement, you talked about 
what people can have and not have and the consistency. I go through those checkpoints all over the country regularly. What I don't see is I don't see anything that says, here is a traveler's right. You have a right to a private uh, thing. You have a right, and I, I know, Mr. Chairman, I have gone over, but I know a lot of us have. I have seen repeatedly TSA individuals tell people who are traveling with another person that is being held for secondary, stand back, go over there. They are deliberately denying what you said was a right here today. And I hold you to post, the TSA, to post that I have a right to have my spouse. You have a right to have your child or whatever with you during any secondary and not be told they must go over there, stand over there. You could be arrested if you don't move away. The exact opposite has happened in the experience of thousands of travelers. Will you agree to post so travelers know that your TSA people are wrong if they try to say, stand back, you can't be there? So I believe the uh, description about you know, uh, being able to have a, 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 a traveling companion or family member with you, uh, particularly in a uh, private screening area, is up on our TSA website. Website doesn't make it when your people right, are saying we, the we opposite. Will, we, will need to, we will need to move on here. Will this, you commit this, the, to make sure that it is available to the public at the point at which they may being, be being told that they cannot have that person with them? Uh, part of the challenge that we have is that uh, signage, you know, we, we run into having uh, too many signs out there, or um, so having a posting at the checkpoint is difficult for us because we have uh, requirements for so many signs. The, the Chair will recognize that as a no. If you want to continue to add uh, testimony, this is the problem with trying to, to fit this in. Uh, Thank we are you, about Mr. to Chairman. be called, uh, called for votes. We have two other members. It is the uh, policy of this committee to first recognize those who actually sit on the subcommittee first. <laughs> So I am going to recognize the Chairman of the Transportation Committee, a me full member of this uh, committee and subcommittee first, uh, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Okay, Mr. Uh, Kerr and Mr. Kane, uh, we bought about, uh, or were, have we bought 250 of the rapid scan uh, backscatters? Is that uh, either purchased or uh, being purchased? Is that correct? That is correct, Congressman. Uh, what is the estimated cost of that equipment? Hundred million, I believe. All told, for all the equipment we've purchased so far, and I don't know the split, is around 122 million dollars for rapid scan for uh, both the rapid scan and the L3 for the 500 machine. Okay, L3. Did uh, former Secretary uh, Cheridoff uh, talk, consult, or communicate with either of you two? Uh, no, Congressman, he did not. No, for me, sir. Can you provide to the committee? Uh, records of any of his communications between those involved in the acquisition of the equipment? Uh, I am not sure how I would locate records. There was no one in TSA involved with him in the acquisition of the equipment, so I, I, I think the record would be zero from TSA's perspective. Of, can of, you provide the committee, of, uh, can you check uh, the records of representatives of, what is it, L3 that, per that you purchased that equipment from? I am sorry, Congressman, I didn't. The equipment was purchased. We talked about rapid scan and there is millimeter wave. I am interested in finding out uh, the contacts of the former uh, secretary with TSA, either prior to, during, or at some time uh, of the acquisition. Can you check your records? Congressman, we can, we can do that. I can tell you he was not involved from the acquisition perspective of those machines any time after being secretary, at least, and clearly as his oversight of the department, um, he would have been some involvement before that. All right. Uh, we have had, uh, uh, actually, the uh, backscatter is nothing new. I remember at least five years ago we had uh, uh, stick devices that uh, you could uh, 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 you could deploy or software that would give you a stick image rather than the full body scan. Um, is that correct? Are you aware that they had that? No, I'm not. Uh, Mr. Kerr? I'm not familiar with that, sir. Well, they have had it. I understand you're now testing that. Yes, we're testing the automated target recognition software, which is okay. the generic outline of a person. And when do you expect those tests to be finished? Uh, we, we have them for on the millimeter wave, the L3 machines. We have them in the airports today. They'll be, uh, we'll finish up with the specific testing we have to do on those uh, probably by the end of this month. OK. 
Okay. It was about a 45 to 60 day. Uh, it just, I, I can't believe it because five years ago that software was available, um, so we didn't have to uh, have a, and, and objections were raised five years ago, and uh, we were told that technology was available. Um, you have uh, testing uh, in your testimony. Uh, two, testing began in 2007, included testing and evaluation of both laboratory and uh, airports. Uh, uh, when did you first notify Congress that you uh, were going to uh, uh, deploy the equipment and it was fully tested? I am not sure there was a specific time frame that we did that, Congressman. I know in our budget request, clearly when we requested the machines and the funding for the machines, we communicated to Congress. Did you provide yes. any evaluation of your testing at those airports? Um, we have provided sub uh, very substantial briefings and That was after the deployment, uh, I, I, I would my, at least to my staff. And, and that is possible, Congressman. I, I, I don't know that we came up in advance of uh, deploying to everyone on the Hill. I am not sure. And, uh, are you away, aware of the latest testing of the uh, equipment uh, that uh, GAO conducted in December? Uh, we are aware of GAO's testing as well as the other ongoing testing we have in airports every day. Do you day feel that, that uh, again, uh, what this reminds me of is the puffers, uh, uh, the failure rate was totally unacceptable. Do you, would you concur with that evaluation? Uh, I think we look at different types of testing and we think the machines are very effective against the types of threats that we are looking at. Um, we, we do daily testing in airports across the country. Um, to, to That's your self testing. Uh, have you you have been uh, briefed by GAO on their testing? Yes, I have. And that and you find that acceptable level of performance? I'd like to think that we could perform very well at 100 percent. Do you find the level of failure acceptable uh, that GAO has reported uh, now that you have the equipment in place? So the, the specific number, I think we Oh, would... first of all, we are not going to talk about numbers because it is classified, but the failure is, uh, has been pronounced. Mr. Pistol talked to it. Mr. Pistol said it was a, uh, that uh, GAO was clever. Uh, do you, ex do you uh, feel that the, again, having, having reviewed this, is that uh, failure rate acceptable? We spent well, it's going to spend a quarter of a billion dollars on deploying this equipment and staffing it, and I've had it tested, and uh, to me, it's not acceptable. So I would like to see us do better against GAO testing. Uh, I don't think that's representative. If the American of public, the if we could the reveal uh, the failure rate, the American public would be outraged at that expenditure. But it seems that you have opted for sort of a, a popularity poll. Uh, you said night uh, night that. Uh, 80 percent of the people do not ob object to uh, accept the, the uh, use of that technology, even though it doesn't work. So that's the basis on which we deploy a expensive uh, screening technology. Uh, no, Congressman. I think that's a, a partial basis, but I think the other extensive testing that we did in the labs, that we did in the field, and that we do in the airports every day. Mm -hmm. um, well, the public may accept it, but I'm telling you, I will not. Thank you, and I yield back. The um uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, we have a vote on the floor. We have uh, a committee that is uh, now uh, run past the time it was going to start. Uh, we have other members who have joined us here who want to ask questions. But with 12 minutes ago, we are going to have to stand in recess with the expectation that both of you will come back to te further testify, answer members' questions. Is that your understanding, Mr. Kane? Mr. Chairman, yes, it is. Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman. My apologies to the members. This is not the way we were going to conduct this. This is not uh, right and fair to the members. I appreciate the public and those that have traveled here to do this. Nevertheless, we will continue this hearing uh, at a date to be determined. Uh, we stand in recess. Thank you.